So constitutions are important in spite of their sort of abstractness for the general public and in spite of many technicalities which, of course, uh, are appreciated only by the great technicians or such as myself. But in spite of that, really, they have to discipline the exercise of power. So, in a way, they have to establish traffic rules. And in another way, they have to establish traffic rules that are convenient for the drivers, that is, democratic traffic rules. And, and unless you have the traffic rules in order, and unless you have um, controllable, checkable, uh, let's say, democratic-oriented traffic rules, then a political system is, can't function much. Now, uh, my argument here, but uh, Jorge has said everything already, so I can spare much of my, the remaining of my voice. Uh, the argument is that in, in this uh, postface, it really was written as a preface. Uh, but then, at the very last minute, the, 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 the publisher, the Fondo de Cultura, decided that it should be a postface. Fine. But the point is that if it's a preface, then I don't need to write a preface. If it's a postface, then I do need to write the preface. <laughs> they haven't thought of that. So now we have a postface without preface. And on top of it, just to say, you know, that even publishers are not better than, than politicians at times. Uh, on top of it, the, the fact that the importance of the book is in the past phase disappears completely in the cover. And is not even mentioned in, in, the back, in the back page. Now, any normal publisher would at least put a band across and say, look, there is a past phase. But that band... I mean, it was probably too expensive or too difficult to write, <laughs> so it doesn't appear. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying very hard with his help to explain that this is, it's, it's, the book is important now because of this past face which is not prefaced. <laughs> Funny things happened in the world, um, not only in Mexico, uh, I have written a letter of complaint at Columbia to my, uh, to my, um, not the president, but to, to the, um, to the real, uh, to the, to the provost, which in the United States is the man really in charge. I had many complaints, so I wrote a letter to him saying, a university run by zombies cannot be a good university. <laughs> now, zombies, you know, exist even at Columbia. Indeed, uh, uh, everywhere. So eventually a few exist even in Mexico, and this is a good example, I think, of zombie-like handling. Anyhow, being serious. Um, at the moment, uh, just need, and then I, I take the questions, but at the moment my, my, my diagnosis is that the old mechanisms are dead, and they were de facto mechanisms, largely. Uh, and, and you don't have new mechanisms in place. And since presidential systems in themselves are, well, structurally, are paralysis-prone structures, uh, so it's very serious if they don't have mechanisms in place for overcoming stalemate and paralysis. More serious than a, in a, a parliamentary system. Although even parliamentary systems can function horrendously, to be sure. But the, the problem with presidential systems, it, they, they are based on the principle of the separation of power. And on that principle, then, since, in fact, these separated powers have to work together because there is a legislative process uh, which is the requirement for democratic governance. <laughs> you know, important issues of governing have to take the form of law. So there's a legislative process which is required to happen. And if you have separation of powers, you have a problem of having a legislative process which, which performs.
So that is basically the issue. And, and, and that, that, uh, that, uh, this is what I'm trying to handle in this proposal. And also in the book, because the book has, since it, it explains a lot about the French system, and also I have this weird proposal about alternating presidentialism, which is a pretext really, not because I believe that anybody will adopt it, but because it was a good way of explaining how to make this kind of machinery workable. So there I have a lot of uh, details on, on the ways and means in which, well, a president uh, can get across without violating uh, democratic principles. So um, uh, this, this is, is, is the issue here, and, and uh, uh, the, the, I think it's very interesting because uh, most, if not all, uh, Latin American presidential system are dysfunctional in the sense that I'm discussing. They are paralysis prone and they have to override the structural stalemates with decretismo and other in illegal ways of handling politics. So I, you have golpes in the past, you have circumventing parliament with uh, abuses of decretismo, in the, not in the technical sense of the word, but in the descriptive sense. And, and uh, here I'm saying, but look, um, maybe this time we can, we can uh, do a presidential system that is better than the ones that we have in Latin America. Because the Latin American ones copied the American system. And, 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 and the American system happens to work because it's 200 years old. Uh, because people want it to work, which is not necessarily the case in other countries. Parliament, Congress wants it to work, President wants it to work, and then for other reasons, uh, some even not excessively exciting ones, pork barrel, party indiscipline, et cetera, et cetera. But anyhow, it manages to work even with divided government. Uh, in Latin America, most of Latin America, uh, government is often divided, more than it has been in the United States in the past, and then uh, these other features that allow for the American presidential system to muddle through, these other features are absent. And uh, this, this creates for, as I say, dysfunctional presidential system. So I say, but look, here you had an authoritarian presidential system, so quite a novel invention. Uh, you could use uh, some of this experience to have an efficient democratic presidential. That's, that's the argument. Uh, and then I say, I don't recommend you to write a new constitution because it would take you 20 years. Because, you know, under democratic auspices, you would have to ha have a constituent assembly. Constituent assemblies are disasters because, you know, the candidates run on party platforms, so they arrive there with party instructions, their view of the new constitution. They end up with disagreeing or by creating a bastard, where instead uh, constitutions must have their logic. They must have, they must have an inner logic. If, if you, if you, if they are pa patches of, of different animals, then, then, they don't work. So I uh, stick with the Constitution of 1917, which wasn't a bad Constitution at all. Uh, actually, it was a good Constitution. Uh, much better than most more recent Constitutions. And make the necessary changes in that Constitution. Which are not that very many because the, the uh, authoritarian presidentialism that you had in the past really was a de facto a transformation of the formal constitution into a material constitution which, of course, violated the formal constitution. So as, as this de facto house of power collapses, you're left with a decent constitution which I think can be touched on a number of points and can be made functional. That's the idea. Uh, if, 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 if this idea is, you know, uh, makes a sense, uh, and if uh, to you and to others, of course, uh, I wish I had the power to enact it with the sword, but I have lost my sword coming to Mexico, so I don't have that power. 
Um, then it would be interesting, not only for Mexico, but for the whole of Latin America, because you would have an instance of democratic functioning presidentialism. So that, that's the just that's the, the purpose. Uh, nothing is perfect in this uh, project. Uh, I'm sure it's not complete. I'm sure you can it be, you know, it can be uh, discussed on many points. But that's the sort of map that I'm trying to outline in this strange post facio without prefacio. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Abrimos una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. It depends on whether people have read the post facio. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I understand enough. And if I don't understand so much, the better for me. You know, I reply what I want. <laughs> that's out of, that's, that's besides the topic, isn't it? What is the constitutional aspect of your question? <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm not quick at understanding questions. No, I, I you know, I, I really would like us to stay to the topic. Uh, I have, I have said something about this in interviews to papers, television, indeed, because you know, although I'm an enemy, I'm an accepted enemy, so I go on television. Uh, there's a great uncertainty. Media don't know how to handle this new situation. Because if you have a war, then you must stay on your side. But this is a strange war in which, uh, in which you can stay on both sides if you want. Because, I mean, unless, of course, the, the only reason why, why the, the, uh, the, the other side is, is, is not, uh, uh, is, is, is at the time, has not done as well as it could be, first of all, because we don't know who's the other side quite clearly, and secondly, because uh, the other side, which in this case has been the Taliban's, are very stupid, uh, which is not surprising. We shouldn't, you see, they, they hate so much Americans and foreigners that they don't realize that it's much to their advantage to have foreign television there, you know, taking the bombs and the, the children that are killed and the women that cry. So luckily for us, they, are, they haven't had the intelligence to grasp that. But this is a very serious issue for the future, and that's all I'm going to say. Voice. You can yell if you want. <laughs> About media? Yes. Okay. About yes. yesterday's comment about media. Uh, I understood that media has become like a form of government because of their manipulation of information. And if we analyze uh, possible solution to control the, the information. We know that competition is not, is not an answer for that because then the quality of information diminish. How, I mean, what could be a solution so that the information that is exposed through media can be something useful for the society? We are really getting out of the subject. Again, I mean, I would like to see, um, I, I, I understand that the problem here is that you haven't read the post face. But, uh, but uh, I would like to really to stick to this argument, and uh, Jorge Islas, in fact, has sort of illustrated the various points. So I, 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 I do not want, you know, to, to uh, I think we need some discipline. We can't speak about everything uh, uh, in any specific meeting. So uh, the, the only thing I want to say is that um, if your question addresses uh, how can media be disciplined constitutionally or legally, I don't know. I don't think, I don't like that. Uh, I think this, this they, in all professions, they must be 
the professional ethics. Doctors uh, can kill you and do kill you, but still they take an oath. And that's their professional ethics. And the media is just is not different. Uh, we must be capable and responsible enough for having uh, and adopting and pursuing a professional ethics. If the word ethics still has a meaning, and that's a problem. I hope so. Hi. Um, talking about the Constitution itself, I, wanna, I would like to know if you have any opinion um, about the number of legislators that we should have in the um, in the Congress here in Mexico, if we should reduce that number, considering that uh, 500 congressmen is a lot of people to maybe uh, come up with a, with a decision. So would it be uh, better if we had less congressmen and uh, would it still uh, be democratic or representative? I, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Finish? No. Uh, I'm not sanguine about, you know, whether uh, representatives are 300 or 600. Uh, and if the argument is that they are costly, well, I can think of many other ways of wasting money, which are worse. So that's not the real issue. The, the, size, the size of parliament um, has to balance two requirements. The, the, the lesser the representatives, the larger the districts. The greater the number of the representatives, the smaller the districts. So you have to decide, you know, how to play this, this balance. Large districts have, depending on the electoral system, of course, but have the advantage of, disadvantage of largeness. So whatever element of directness of local ties, et cetera, et cetera, is lost the larger the district. Of course, the advantage is to have lesser representatives. On the other hand, you know, the smaller the district, the greater the number of representatives. Um, I don't think that it makes much difference, however, whether a parliament, in terms of decision-making capabilities, is made of a thousand people or a hundred. Hundred people can be as litigious and as divided and as incapable of reaching an agreement as a thousand. So the, the background factor here is party discipline. If you have party discipline, democratic discipline, you know, not, not, not only stick and whips. Uh, if you have party discipline, English type, you know, doesn't make any difference. You have party discipline. And for the internal working of the parliamentary process, I believe you must have party discipline. Because otherwise you will never have agreements and you will never have an orderly legislative process. If everybody, you know, is an anarchist there, I mean, even 10 people can block everything. So I'm not sanguine about numbers. But the, the, the issue there, aside from the question of party discipline, is really the balance between small and larger districts, and the drawbacks and advantages of either. Well, uh, I would like to ask you, I really like the idea about the re-election in the legislative power uh, as a motivation for the, the, the legislative work, but what happened, for example, in Mexico, where the people uh, doesn't know to recognize quality in a legislative work, because in Mexico, the people, uh, because of the the system we have around the president, uh, doesn't uh, only take the quality from the actions that president does, but doesn't know to recognize the quality or the the efficiency of a of a law directly. And so, what happened in this case is combined with, for example, the the media show uh, could uh, help politicians and, and the people in the legislative power to make the, the, their work to look better. Well, I'm, I, I think I got the question and if I didn't, uh, my alter ego here will correct me. But, uh, but um, you see, you have to start somewhere. I mean, if you have a past which does not assist you in this matter, as you do, 
as that as is the case, nevertheless, you must start a new system. And uh, the, the argument here is that even if so far the people are really not able to identify, you know, who's who in legislation and who's good and who's bad, first of all, this is the case also in other countries because uh, the, the public is not attentive enough to know that. It knows it better with small districts, for instance. That would be one of the advantages of having small districts. But in large countries, you cannot have districts that small. You know, you, it's easy to have small districts in Ireland. Uh, it's, well, in England, they have, you know, uh, they, they have low numbers and a 55 million population. With 100 million, it becomes hard and, and, and so forth. So uh, the, the, the point is here that um, uh, this is a new beginning. It's a chicken, a chicken and egg problem. Uh, I say let's make members re-electable. First of all, because this empowers parliament. Otherwise, you know, parliament is a hotel uh, in which members uh, uh, sit there are waiting for patronage to give them the next job. So this is ridiculous and of course creates a powerless parliament. So that's the first step. It has to be done anyhow, whatever the other drawbacks may be, it seems to me. Then if people sit in parliament for a while, first they acquire expertise, then they acquire more independence because they're not job seekers, they are waiting for the, you know, their patron to give them the next job. And finally they become identified by their electors. So I think the first step, despite, you know, the difficulties that you're mentioning, is to have re-electability on, on, on these and other counts. I think it's a very strong requirement. If we don't permit re-electability, you'll never have a serious parliament and an independent parliament uh, with uh, sufficient legs to walk uh, on its own credentials and capabilities. Yeah. Okay, I have two questions. The first one is, Professor Islas was talking about four reforms, a specific reforms changed. Instead of changing all the constitution that you suggested in the book of four specific reforms to, to get well, to the... Four plus others. But yeah, plus basically others, but basically yeah. <laughs> that four yeah. most important. So if you could tell us the meaning of, of that four and the other question is about the term you use to change uh, the, the presidential system to an alternative. So what do you mean by alternative? By alternative? Is that the question? No, the first one, I, 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 you remind me about the second. Um, well, you know, sometimes my Spanish fails and then it's a very good excuse because if I don't know how to reply, I say I didn't understand the question. So this is, you know, I'm a clever man. Don't, don't, don't underestimate it. Uh, the, the first question. Um, the, the, the reforms are four because, because I, I, you know, that's the summary of the reforms. Then if you detail them, there are many more. But the, the, the argument is that it's, if you want to do it, and to do it fast, with agreement, and, uh, and, 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 you know, have this done, then you must establish priorities. And the priorities are four. That's, the reforms may be a little bit more, but the priorities are four in my, in my proposal. So one is to strengthen parliament, and this, as we have discussed already, is to provide uh, re-electability. Plus other things, but you know, they, the, 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 the priority is to say you need to have a stronger parliament, because as, up until now it was, you know, a subservient parliament. So, and this is not good in a democratic system. The other important reform, which is, you know, constitutional, according to systems. It can be also a matter of ordinary legislation, but is the electoral reform. And I strongly disrecommend the uh, mixed system that you have, which I understand why it was enacted and served its 
well, the purpose of the pre in the past, really, but I think is a very wrong system for the future. And here I have strong arguments because Italians have a mixed system, which I know well, and I explain what happened in Italy with the same kind of mixed system. But by and large, we started with proportional representation with six parties, and now we have about 14. And thanks to the single member district system, not to the PR side or element of the mix. So this, this is, I explain why this happened in Italy and I wouldn't want this to happen in Mexico. So I say, get rid of this bad system in time. Also bad in principle. I think electoral systems should have one logic, not two. You have to know what the purpose, the first purpose is, then you have to pursue that purpose. But anyhow, uh, quite aside from the matter of principle, the Italian experience has been disastrous and could be repeated here. So, uh, priority number two, uh, uh, change electoral system, and I recommend stubbornly for been doing that for, I don't know, 100 years, 200 years, I don't remember exactly, the, the French double ballot system. The French double system has many, uh, you know, you, 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 I, I can think of 50 different ways of really formulating it. But the principle is that you have two elections. The first expresses the pref first uh, 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 preferences of the voters, so it's a good indication. And of really of the party strength and, and of, it's, it's a sincere voting, it's authentic voting. And the second ballot depends on how many people are admitted, then, 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 then you have the reductive effect of an electoral system which does not want to have a polity with 15 or 20 parties because that creates ungovernability. So I, I, I won't get into the details. I, in principle, I like double ballot systems because they have this, you know, electors uh, have two choices. The first is free. The second is constrained. You have to then vote again for who enters the second ballot. But at the first, you freely express your preference. So it has a number of nice characteristics, but in the end, it constrains, it reduces, it blocks party proliferation. Uh, then then I, I enter into the, 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 uh, the presidential powers. So that is one point, but it has many facets. Um, at, at, despite, I realize that if you exit from an authoritarian presidentialism, uh, you're, you're worried about past experience and you're less inclined to see future problems, but uh, you have to, and I say now, uh, now you have a powerless president, structurally speaking. I'm not speaking of Fox. I'm speaking of the institution. Hmm? Because there's no way in which a president can get his legislation across under this non-existent machinery that now is not in place. So I have, I, I discuss a lot this in many aspects. So it's one, but it's many things. Uh, Jorge mentioned uh, the veto, uh, uh, element, veto characteristic. This is an uh, important aspect of uh, presidentialism because, uh, because uh, you know, uh, parliaments can either have initiative in your system or they can just receive legislative proposal and then, you know, completely, completely uh, change it. Uh, they can create a completely different animal. So a president must be able to defend itself and its function by having the, the what is called the line item veto power, uh, which that's the essential difference. If he can, if he, if he gets a bill back, which you know, he, he, he asks for a cat and he gets back a mouse, then the alternative is that he just blocks, says no, and that's the general veto, but that's unhelpful because nothing is done. If he has, if he has the line item veto power, then he can say, no, I asked for a cat, so I take out all the little changes that transform it into a mouse. Very important. I mean, it's a technicality, but if you, you can see how important that is. So that's one of the things that has to be, um, uh, and I won't get into other details. Uh, basically, I have a number of suggestions of 
how uh, a president has the power to get his legislation across, of course, through bargaining and negotiation. I mean, that's, that's part of the game. But he can, if he is utterly powerless, then he will lose. And if so, you have a presidential system which a presidential has no power, but parliament cannot govern. That's a bad animal. Um, I, I also enter then, uh, you know, in, 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 in discussing uh, Supreme Court, a very important institution, of course, in countries that exit from authoritarian experience, so the composition of that, and that has changed endlessly in Mexico. I have a headache just to remind myself and, and, and find out, and even the, the current system is uh, too complicated for my liking. But that, uh, the, the importance of, of a constitutional court, which is not, cannot be packed by political power, uh, is, is, is decisive, I think, in, in any country and especially in uh, uh, transitions or after transitions. So, for instance, there I recommend life tenure, like in the United States. Because again, if, if you give shorter tenure, then there's always a temptation of seeking the next job, like with Parliament. Maybe you shouldn't permit life tenure like uh, the Pope, not until he is 100, but you should establish that, you know, you can an office from when you're appointed until you're 70 or 75. Not decrepitude, but that's it. Because in tenure, life tenure, uh, is immensely important to establish the independency of the judge. And this we've seen in the United States. Judges appointed by democratic presidents have not been democratic at all. Judges appointed by Republican presidents have not been Republican at all. Or I mean, you know, not as Republican as expected. So uh, once they are there, they can judge with their own head. That's very important. If uh, a Supreme Court is, uh, as I think, an essential instrument of a democratic uh, polity, excellent and so forth. The other question now, I've really forgotten. I'm not sure I understood it, but is that enough for you? Thank you. Podríamos pasar a otra pregunta? Bueno. Yes. Now, the first question, you said the democracy had, had a, a democracy for 70 years. Well, that's open to contention, as you know. Um, many people, and I'm one of the many, sometimes I'm even in a majority position, that happens very rarely, but on this score, I believe I, have a, I, I belong to, I have a majority opinion, uh, would not say that uh, that the 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 period of the the pre hegemony the seventy years of the pre hegemony uh, constitute uh, a democratic experience. I have also argued that the America the Mexican system uh, so the 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 the, 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 the presidentialism of those seventy years was not a dictatorship. So I have in some sense said, look, uh, a dictator does not leave office. That's a very important difference. If he really he is a dictator, he does not respect even his own laws. So once he is there, he has absolute power, and I've never seen a real dictator leaving office. He can die, of course. That, that happens also to dictators. So on the one hand, I have said that the Mexican system was not a dictatorship, on the other hand, I've also said it was not a democratic system. And I've called it a hegemonic system. And the hegemony was really, the whole system hinged on the hegemony of the pre. And on the control of the president of the pre, so finally, out of this 
very simple formula. Uh, uh, the president had overriding powers, including the power of Dedazo, which was not terribly democratic, but efficient. But still, it respected its own rules. See, that is the difference between uh, the, the real dictatorship and what happened in Mexico. Um, Hitler could say, I am the law, like Louis XIV. And that was the case. He was the law. There were no rules that he was supposed to respect. He invented them, and that was it. That never happened in Mexico. Mexico was a sort of authoritarian consociational system which had established for itself rules which it respected. First of all, the one that presidents, you know, there's no evidence, only one tried to be re-elected and he died or was killed, what was the case? Yes, but he, he was killed or died, I don't remember, Obregón. He was killed, good for him. Uh, so, so, but that is a very important rule. So, in spite authoritarian, pervasively authoritarian characteristics, it was quite a unique experiment of consensus, internal consensus-based authoritarianism, which respected its rules, which was civil enough. You know, if you, if you compare real dictatorship with Mexico, so in a way, I, when I started writing about this in the late 60s, I'm old, so you know, I have, I have, I have a good record of, of past writings. I said, this is really a unique animal. It's not a dictatorship, it's a hegemonic system, but not an ideological one, but a pragmatic kind of, you know, it pretends to be ideological, Partido Revolucionario Institucional, what would, could be worse as a label, <laughs> ideological, aside from the contradiction, uh, in a contradiction, but I mean, so there was this ideological for say, in fact, it was a highly pragmatic, and, and you know, muddling through kind of, 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 uh, of experience. So I would say that in the past, I would not accept that it was democratic. I do think that now it is, and uh, the, on the basis of, of because it, now it, it is based on uh, an election, or a few elections, but especially the last one, which was really uh, authentic. That is uh, free and, 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 and not uh, and, 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 and credible. And that's a wonderful transition, and other countries have not managed. But of course, the election has killed the old system, the old machinery, the old, but in itself cannot create a new one, and that's the issue we're discussing here. Este, ¿Qué coincidencias existen entre la reforma que propone el maestro Sartori con la parte de la reforma del Estado que propone este, Muñoz Ledo, Porfirio Muñoz Ledo, y respecto a la segunda vuelta, eh, si era que al reformar la Constitución, pues se reforman las leyes secundarias reglamentarias eh, que regulan los diversos artículos reformados, eh, ¿se va a poder impugnar la primera vuelta eh, por parte de los partidos políticos si no están conformes con el resultado obtenido? Esa es una pregunta. Y otra pregunta, eh, en la historia electoral y política de México, una segunda vuelta propiciaría un mayor abstencionismo. Vemos que si en la primera es escasa la votación, los electores de batalla para que concurran a, la, a las urnas, una segunda vuelta no podría provocar un mayor abstencionismo. Gracias. Uh, well, uh, let me, let, uh, you, the first one, but let me start from the end, which, the last point which I understood. Uh, um, this is an old, uh, you know, it's an old uh, note. I mean, the, the charge has been made already that the double ballot system may uh, uh, discourage abstentionism. Um, it really depends on, uh, on the issue. If it's a heated, strongly felt issue, then in fact it does not discourage abstention. Uh, it does, uh, if, if, you know, uh, the, 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 the public perceives that there's not a big difference among candidates, or it does also if there's a big difference 
on the first round between, you know, a candidate that obtains 60% and, oh no, 50 would have passed, 45%, but then there's a split among the others and everybody else is at 10 to 15%. So the, the winner is foregone and in these cases uh, you have a lower turnout. But um, I, I don't think this is a good, even if true, and when it is true and frequently it is, I don't think this is a strong argument. Uh, if if you, you have to provide for voters a good electoral system, which is to their advantage. If they do not want to use it and are disinterested, it's too bad for them. But I don't see why we should provide them with a bad instrument. And then really it depends on the issues. Because when, when a debate is heated, and when in the runoff, the candidates are close, then you get a high turnout. But the basic argument seems to me that um, you must provide, you know, the, the, the right uh, good instrument and then uh, there's freedom not to use it. Uh, overall, in statistical terms, you know, we make great fuss about percentages of voters. Uh, traditional democracies, by now Switzerland, not only the United States, have very low turnouts. It's not dramatic, it seems to me. So what? They have low turnouts. Uh, the, uh, as, 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 a, as a statistician, I always make a case, you know, it's not the, ads, it's not the figures that matter, it's their distribution. If, if a 30%, uh, um, for an illustration, if a 30% turnout has the same distribution than a 90% turnout would have, which we can figure out, makes no difference. If the distribution is changed by low turnout, then there you have a problem. But let's see if the distribution has changed. And in what sense it has changed? Anyhow, you know, I'm 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 a dogmatic in, in in these matters. I want a good system. Whether it's poorly used, that's the fault of the user, and you know, uh, I won't take the blame for them. That's their fault. In, in, what was the other question? I'm sorry. La diferencia entre differences between Muñoz Ledo proposals. Yes. Whether you can sue from the juridical point of view the results in the first round. Whether you can sue legally, sue them if you not agree with the results in the first round. It has never happened. I mean, you know, double ballot systems uh, were the in, in the nineteenth century were very frequent. Uh, now, now. Basically, the, the, uh, the illustration is, is the French case, uh, but they have been used in various formulas for the second part of the 19th century, and I know of no uh, legal issue there. I know of no legal issue in France, and I don't see what, how you can build it. Indeed, the first round uh, uh, calls for authentic voting. Every voter, you know, will express freely without any conditioning of, you know, who's strong or feebler, his first preference. That is strongly democratic, and I don't see that you can make a legal case out of it. You, perhaps you, you think of saying, well, but then why, why the second ballot reduces the number of contestants? And I say, well, that's still better than what is done in plurality systems, <laughs> which is strongly reductive and, you know, really reduces the race to two potential winners, although you can have more candidates. And even that legally has never been challenged because one of the functions of electoral system is also, you know, one is, of course, to uh, permit as many voices as it makes sense, but the other is to control the proliferation and the fragmentation of parties because this in turn surely produces non-governability. But I'm not aware 
I mean, if, if I, I'm, I'm not aware of any case, maybe I'm uh, insufficiently informed, of, of, of going to a constitutional court, for instance, and saying that the double ballot system would not be constitutional. Because if so, you would have to challenge first plurality systems, which on the same grounds would be even more unconstitutional. That would be my, my guess. Yes. Uh, yes. He, he, no, he wants to pursue the point. I mean, that's very quickly. I don't hear him, so you must, because I don't get the audio from him. The main concern is basically yes. whether you are also um, considering uh, secondary reforms, not only the constitutional framework reforms, but indeed the secondary reforms, which means legal reforms. For other no, no. First of all, because I wouldn't be competent to do so in Mexico. I mean, uh, and then, because my argument is, uh, you, you must establish priorities now. So first, you must put the house in order, and then the furniture will have to come. But that's the second step. So that's my answer, but I, now I must. How much time do we have left, actually? Senor? More questions. Y nada, so, yes. Entre la diferencia entre la propuesta de Muñoz Ledo y Giovanni Sartori, yo le puedo contestar la, la pregunta. La propuesta, la primera propuesta de Muñoz Ledo es de 122 reformas a la Constitución, y la del profesor Sartori es de tres reformas. Y una es propuesta por Muñoz Ledo y otra es por Giovanni Sartori. <risa> Maestro Sartori. Profesor. Maestro. Sorry. Yes. Eh, Porfirio Díaz decía que México, una vez dio una entrevista a un periodista norteamericano, a Krilman, que no, México no estaba preparado para la democracia. Cuando llegó la democracia a México con Madero, Madero tuvo muchos problemas, principalmente con un embajador norteamericano. Madero fue asesinado, volvió otra vez el estado crítico para la política y para todo el país. Ahora, con el gobierno de Fox, se presenta la oportunidad de abordar a la democracia. ¿Cuándo un país está preparado para llegar a la democracia? ¿Y qué momento, como usted decía hace un momento, eh, cuando el presidente o el, la institución presidencial falla, hay un motor de emergencia? ¿Qué motor tiene que funcionar cuando los dos motores fallan, como en este caso que hay parálisis casi legislativa en el país? Y si el, 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 la forma que usted explicó ahorita de la comparación entre el sistema francés de la guillotina podría aplicarse en México. This, this is a long question, but um, let me briefly address whatever I can in the short time. And of course, um, I don't like the argument that a country is not prepared for democracy. So now that is a very destructive uh, argument, self-destructive. It's true. You know, there are countries clearly, especially if you talk of Africa, that is absolutely true, and we have good evidence of that. Um, I think that, however, it's not a good argument any longer across the Western world, uh, which includes, I would assume, Latin America. But uh, just apply it, you know, you could have said that of Japan, even better. You know, were they prepared for democracy? Absolutely not. They lost the war, they had an imposed constitution, and since then they are performing democratically. That is an extreme case, but I think a good one. They belong to a different political tradition, a different civilization, and yet they have been, you know, normally and decently performing democracy since the late 40s. So let's not make, I, I, I know that there are uh, requisite conditions for democracy, 
But I would say that the Islamic world is not prepared for democracy because they are a theocratic society. And I would say that you have uh, that much of, of African society is not prepared for democracy because all of the preconditions that have been discussed about uh, do not occur. But I would say that all Western countries, Western type countries, Western countries, uh, Latin America, you can, you know, you can say that, of course, they're less prepared and will have more trouble. But I would uh, just uh, say that uh, I, I don't accept that kind of argument because it's self-defeating. What was uh, the other question? I don't remember. <laughs> he should remember. He's my memory. What's he doing here? <laughs> Very quickly, because we don't, but yes. La alternancia en quien debió haber caído en México para que hubiera sido más fácil el tránsito hacia la democracia. Izquierda o derecha? What, what? Yes, that's why you have to uh, translate it for me. Simplify it and translate it. Yes, quickly, quickly. Where the well, alternation should go left or, or right in order to establish the transition to democracy in Mexico? Well, if, 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 if until you have uh, basically a three party system, uh, uh, you know, you, you have pre established alternation. If it doesn't occur, you remain where you are. And if it does occur, you go on the other side. <laughs> 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 so as long as the party system is that elemental, then um, it's like in two party systems. Either you have it, or if not, uh, you know what the alternative is. And now here we have an, un an, an uncertainty because on, on the left-right spectrum, of course you can have other dimensions, but on the left-right spectrum, yeah, the placements are uh, still somewhat fluid. Clearly, you have an izquierda, which is the extreme left. Uh, clearly, you have the pan, which represents the right, more or less. But then the pre now is a difficult animal to identify because it may have many souls and, and developments. So, would you say the, the pre is the center? Well, I'm not sure yet because the center is defined by the wings. And if its wings are still uh, of an uncertain future, then there, there I'm, I wait to see further. Uh, but for the time being, I'm, I'm simply saying if, 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 if there will be alternation because the pan is not strong enough to win another victory. Now, to whom? Probably the, 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 the other, the second, the alternative is the pre again, unless it splits, which it's not likely to do, I mean, as, as I see things. So that would be my reply to that question. Una pregunta más, Mil Bernardo. How, how do you think a semi-presidential system, a French-like yes. system, uh, would work for Mexico. Don't you think there is a need for separating the, the chief of state functions from the chief of government functions? Well, I, in the book, so that's in the book and you must read it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> even though you belong to the video society, you still must read my book. I mean, uh, unless you put it on the video, which I recommend strongly, but for the time being. There I defend very strongly, as you know, the, the French system, I think it's a very intelligent invention. And you know, constitution inventions are pretty rare. I mean, uh, it's not like invention a new toy. I mean, they're pretty rare. We are slow in, in these matters, uh, but they're difficult. So in, in principle, I would say, no, it's a better system. Uh, Semi-presidential French type system is a better system than presidential systems because it's no longer based on the division of power. And so it overcomes that problem. So there, in essence, you have a two-headed system, but uh, parliamentary elections establish who has the stick, either the chief of state or the chief of government. And if so, authority is well defined. You never have minority governments. So it's a very efficient system, and it's not true that it doesn't work with cohabitation. It works even with cohabitation. That's the argument of the book. But um, I think that you have to work, I mean, concretely with, with, with the country you're dealing with. Um, Mexico has this tradition. I say first, 
see if you can utilize for the good your own tradition. It's much simpler and much more expedient because I don't quite see a Mexican Constituency Assembly agreeing on the French system. So, you know, if you start on that track, you get into an endless discussion about constitution reform, and I'm not sure that uh, the illumination of these legislators will say, no, 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 the French system is the best. So I wouldn't want to run that risk. So in principle, I like the French system. In practice, I think you must work with what you have and see first if you can improve that.